Hello and welcome back. Um, in this lecture we're going to talk about the muscular system and begin to understand its complexity. Uh, we'll do some, um, you know, talk about muscle cells, muscle cell physiology, and uh, work our way to um, understanding um, <clears throat> how the muscles, muscular system works. And uh, eventually we'll be learning the muscles of the body. So the muscular system has a lot of functions, as you very well probably already know. We, of course, there is the movement. Um, that's a major part of the muscular system. The muscles are attached to, uh, to bones, and the bones act as levers, and the muscles pull on those. Um, you know, all the time we're maintaining posture because of muscular system. It's something we don't think about because it's involuntarily done. But uh, your body position and posture are all controlled by muscles. Um, muscles stabilize joints. They also generate heat. Every time a muscle contracts, you generate heat. Um, part of the muscular system helps to propel food through the, um, through the digestive system. It forms valves. The, there are muscles that form little circular valves that ensure the one-way passage of food through your digestive system. Um, these valves are called sphincters. They do control the pur uh, our pupil size. Uh, they uh, protect internal organs from damage. If you have strong rectus abdominis muscles, which are your abdominal muscles, that helps to protect you from, from impacts. Muscles are used to express emotions. So you can see there's a wide variety of, of muscle functions um, in, inside of our body. Muscle tissue is very, very, very special, and uh, muscle cells are very special too. Um, there are certain characteristics that they are going to have that are different than other types of tissue. For one thing, uh, muscle tissue has the ability to receive and respond to stimuli, so they are excitable. Um, you know, nervous cells are also excitable, but um, very few cells in the human body are, are excitable in that kind of way and can, can change their, their voltage. They have the ability to shorten when stimulated. This is called contractility, so that's a rare, uh, a rare property that these cells have. Um, they can be stretched or extended, so they have extensibility. And they have elastic recoil, so they have elasticity. So uh, excitability, contractility, um, extensibility, and elasticity are some special characteristics that make muscle tissue different than, say, epithelial tissue or connective tissue. So just as a little review, there's a little chart right here, and it shows that there are different kinds of muscle cells and, and muscle tissue. We have skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. Of course, skeletal muscle tissue is what we're going to focus on in this particular lecture um, predominantly. And then when we do the, uh, the cardiovascular system, we'll do cardiac. And when we do the um, digestive system, we'll do smooth. But uh, skeletal muscle tissue looks like this. It, it has striations. It's multinucleated. Um, cardiac muscle tissue looks like this. It's bifurcated. It has intercalated discs. It's not multinucleated. There's only one single nucleus. And then smooth muscle tissue looks like this. So we have spindly shaped cells that kind of look like this. They have a single nucleus and they're not striated. Okay, so you can see some of the characteristics here. Multinucleated, bifurcated, single nucleus, and down here, spindle shaped, single nucleus. Uh, of course, skeletal muscle is voluntary, cardiac muscle is involuntary, and smooth muscle tissue is involuntary. So they have each unique characteristics that they share. So skeletal muscle tissue, just to remind you, is voluntary. It's under the control of your nervous system. It typically is found in skeletal muscles that create body movement. Smooth muscle tissue is typically found in the irises. Those are the colored portion of your eyes, the walls of blood vessels, urinary bladder, stomach, intestines, and the uterus. Uh, some of these are under the control of hormones. Other are self-exciting. That is, when they stretch, they contract. And... Uh, and then they excite surrounding muscle cells to do the same thing. And then cardiac muscle tissue is only found in the heart. It's involuntary. And the muscles are joined end to end, creating cross bands called uh, intercalated discs. So if you have a cell going this way and a cell going this way, this is where they join the intercalated disc. And this is where they have desmosomes, and they'll have gap junctions there. The desmosomes hold the cells together, and the gap junctions allow for the exchange of of uh, ions through those little uh, pores. 
Okay, so a couple little hodgepodge things before we get into full-blown um, muscle cells. Um, this is the general st structure of a muscle. So there is, for every muscle, there is an origin. This is the fixed attachment point. So in, in this particular diagram here, you can see the scapula has the coracoid process. Here's the acromion. And you can see that, uh, that this muscle here called the bicep is attaching to the coracoid process via that little tendon right there. And that would be considered the origin or the fixed attachment point. Okay, so that's the origin. Um, the insertion is the movable attachment point. Here we see that the, it's attaching to that radial tuberosity, and uh, that's a tendon right there. And since this is the point that's moving, we call that the insertion, and that's the movable attachment point for the muscle. So a tendon is the thing that connects a muscle to a bone. So you can see the tendon is here, and the tendon is up here as well. You can see that this tendon right here goes through the interturbicular groove of the humerus, and it's going to attach in to the scapula. Okay, so each muscle has an origin and insertion, and if you go into um, into uh, kinesiology or physical therapy or physical therapy assistance, you'll be learning a lot of origins and insertions. I mean, that's your business is to know how muscles uh, are connected in and joints and things like that. So you'll be learning a lot more than you will in this class. We'll only learn a few of, um, well, you know, 50 or 60 muscles and just a few of the origins and insertions. Okay, so let's dive into talking about how muscles are organized. So when you cut a muscle in, in, um, in a cross section, you can see that it has a, a very striking um, uh, organization to it. It's very sophisticated. So let's work our way from the highest level of organization to the lowest level of organization and understand the arrangement of a muscle. So you know that muscles are connected to bones, so we have a bone there, and they're connected to bones via the tendon. The tendon is made of, of um, a dense uh, regular connective tissue that fuses into the periosteum or the bone skin. So literally, the muscle tendon is going to grow into uh, the periosteum, and you know the periosteum is really intimately connected with the bone. Um, you know, through sharp paste fibers, it's, it's like sealed to the bone. So when a muscle pulls on a tendon, it's definitely going to pull the bone or, you know, whatever, it's, uh, whatever other uh, bone it's attached to is going to be pulled and moved. So the fascia, again, is a, uh, is a connective tissue. It's uh, a dense, regular connective tissue, very, very tough, lots of uh, collagen fibers. And it's going to cover the entire uh, the entire muscle. It'll be kind of a shiny whitish layer. It'll eventually it'll be really white, really tough when you go into the tendon. And then as you get into what we call the epimyceum, which is the covering around the muscle of connective tissue, it uh, becomes a little thinner and a little clearer and shiny. Uh, intimately connected with the epimyceum, or the covering all around the whole muscle, is the perimyceum. The perimyceum, you can see inside, is going around in these little, making these little circular units. These little circular units are called fascicles. Okay. Now, the, ep the epimyceum and perimyceum are continuous with each other. They grow into each other, and they, um, they are uh, intimately connected. So if the perimyceum moves, the epimyceum moves, and vice versa. So if we go and we look at a fascicle, so if we take one of these little bundles and the artist has pulled it out for us to see here, so this whole thing here is called a fascicle. And a muscle, if you look at a steak, you know, next time you go to a Walmart and you look at a steak, you'll actually see all the fascicles. Each of these little units right here is a fascicle, and the artist is trying to show you that by pulling one out over here. So that's the repeating unit of a cross-sectional muscle is a fascicle. The fascicle is going to have, uh, it's going to have um, axons of motor neurons. These are the, the little um, extensions out of a neuron that are going to communicate electrical signals to the muscle. It's going to have blood vessels um, that are going to be all around to feed the muscle with uh, oxygen and nutrients and take away waste products. So that's going to all be in a fascicle. 
Well, just as a fascicle, you know, so if we look at a muscle and the muscle is made of fascicles, a fascicle is made of muscle cells. So if we take down here and see what the artist has done, they pulled one muscle fiber out of a fascicle. And so if I take one fascicle and show you what a fascicle looks like, it's made of lots and lots of muscle fibers. And muscle fiber and muscle cell are interchangeable terms. So those are all muscle cells. Okay, so if I just kind of sketch this up here, these would all be muscle cells inside of the fascicle. Okay, so uh, one muscle fiber is a muscle cell. Now you know a muscle cell is going to have a nucleus, what's well, going to be multinucleated. It's going to have an outer covering called the sarcolemma. It's going to have sarcoplasmic reticulum and myofibrils and filaments. Each of these parts we're going to talk about very specifically in just a few minutes. Uh, surrounding all of the muscle cells, though, is an endomycium. It's a connective tissue covering, ensuring that all those things are held in place. And in between those are going to be muscles, excuse me, are going to be blood vessels to feed each individual muscle fiber. So let me let me clean this up just a little bit here. So um, this might take you a few minutes to sit and think about because this is pretty sophisticated how these things are arranged. Uh, in regards to uh, their their organization, but um, but again, a muscle's you know connected to a bone via a tendon. There is a fascia or covering around all muscle cells, and uh, it's called uh, uh, epimysium is the portion that's around this muscle right here. Um, the muscle is made of fascicles, so there's fascicles that make up the muscle cell, and they have paramyceum or a connective tissue covering around all the fascicles. Around, uh, so if you take one fascicle and look at it, it has endomyceum that covers the entire surface of each of the muscle fibers or muscle cells, and one fascicle is made of lots and lots of muscle cells. Muscle cells are are each made of myofibrils, which again are bundles of thick and thin filaments that are going to be the contractile elements that allow muscle contraction to occur. So you want to study, you know, this level of organization. Um, and this over here shows you that the muscle is made of fascicles, the fascicles are made of muscle cells, the muscle cells are made of myofibrils, and the myofibrils are made of thick and thin fil filaments that you can see here. And these are the contractile elements that are going to allow muscle contraction to occur. Okay, so that, that's pretty deep, and we'll look at that in lab a little bit as well. Okay, so let me just talk to you about how muscle cells are formed, and then we'll get into what muscle cells, how they're arranged. So there are embryonically called, my, there are these cells called myoblasts, and these myoblasts will come together, and they will fuse, and you can see they fuse here to form um, an immature muscle fiber. So the reason muscle cells are multinucleated is because they're made of myoblasts, which are fused and left their individual um, nuclei inside of the uh, the one muscle cell. Some of the myoblasts will become satellite cells and these will be cells that will be um, cells that will sit on the outside surface of muscle uh, cells and they'll help to repair or, or maybe even fuse uh, with the muscle fiber if it's been damaged and repair the muscle cell. Of course these immature muscle fibers will become mature muscle fibers. Once there are a mature muscle fiber inside of an adult um, they do not undergo reproduction. So, um, you know, you're born with all the muscle cells you're ever going to have because the, of the lack of reproduction of, of, uh, of mature muscle cells. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the microscopic anatomy of a muscle fiber. So let's talk about the parts and then we'll put them all together and show you what a cell looks like. So uh, a muscle cell does have a sarcolemma. A sarcolemma is the, the muscle cell membrane, and it's a very special cell membrane. That's why they give it a special name called sarcolemma. So it, um, it's going to have um, you know, the sodium leak channels. It's going to have the potassium leak channels. It's going to have the sodium-potassium pump. It's going to also have um, voltage-gated sodium channels. So it has some unique parts that we'll talk about and break down in a few minutes. The sarcolemma will invaginate. So if I were to look at the sarcolemma like from a side view, it invaginates and goes deep down into the muscle um, into the muscle cell, and that's called a T-tubule. And they're just invaginations of the sarcolemma. The sarcoplasm is going to be the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, 
and uh, it has some unique properties as well. Inside of it, it's going to be glycosomes, which are granules of stored glycogen. Glycogen is a polysaccharide, and it stores glucose molecules that are strung together in long, long strings. These glucose molecules can be released when we need energy to undergo uh, extended uh, contractions of muscle cells. If you're an athlete, you store more glycosomes. You make more glycosomes. If you're not, you don't have as many. So if zombies are chasing you and you you're uh, you have a couple of athletes and then a couple of couch potatoes, the couch potatoes are going to wear out of energy because they don't have a lot of glycosomes and they'll be the people that are caught by the zombies. So myoglobin is a red pigment which stores oxygen in your muscle cells. Now you need sugar and you need oxygen in order to make uh, ATP. So uh, athletes will make more myoglobin as well. And uh, so it's important to exercise so you have lots of myoglobin and uh, lots of glycosomes. Myofibrils are the little bundles of hundreds and thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of rod-like contractile elements that are called myofilaments. Myofilaments are going to be what we call actin and myosin, and they're going to be the little filaments that are going to contract to cause a muscle to shorten. So there is a specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum that's inside of the, uh, of the muscle cell, and uh, it stores and releases calcium. Uh, without calcium, you don't have a muscle contraction, so it's an important part of the, uh, of the muscle cell. Muscle cells also have mitochondria, and uh, there are three types of, of skeletal muscle uh, uh, cells, and they'll have differing amounts of, of mitochondria. Some muscle cells do really short periods of work, and, uh, and uh, so they're like for sprinter uh, muscles, and uh, they'll have very few mitochondria, but muscles for like marathon kinds of activities are going to have lots and lots of mitochondria. Okay, so those are some of the muscle cell parts. All right, so muscle cells are, are really sophisticated. So, you know, you'll be responsible for knowing these parts and probably for a test, you need to have something like this picture and everything will be whited out and you'd have to label it. So you want to be real familiar with the muscle cell parts. So muscle cells are multinucleated. You can see nuclei on either end there. And that's because of the way that they were created and formed through the myoblasts. Uh, they do have the, uh, the sarcolemma, which is this uh, outer uh, membrane. You can see that the sarcolemma does have openings called transverse tubules, and those transverse tubules will dive deep into the muscle cell. There's also the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You can see it's highly spread out uh, in this diagram here. And uh, there are these cisternae, which are like little chambers that store calcium. And then it branches out all over little branches of the smooth muscle, uh, excuse me, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, branch out over the surface of the muscle cell. Okay, so you can see how that's, uh, that's arranged there. So um, on either side of a transverse tubule, there are two cisternae. So we call that a triad because there's three things that are making that up. The mitochondria are spread all throughout. You can see them all spread out through the muscle cell over here and here. And those are the little powerhouses that make ATP from the breakdown of sugar and using oxygen. Uh, we can see sarcoplasm is the, is the juices that are around, the cytoplasm that's around. There's a sarcolemma again from a little side view. Um, and then you can see the myofibrils. These are the myofibrils here. And these are bundles of thick and thin, thin um, filaments. So the thick and thin filaments uh, are going to be arranged inside of these myofibrils. These myofibrils extend the, the whole length of the muscle cell. And uh, you can increase the number of these myofibrils and get larger muscles, or you can decrease the size of them and, uh, and get short, uh, smaller muscles. So our muscles have the ability to hypertrophy or grow in size or atrophy or shrink in size. So you can grow more myofibrils and you can grow more thick and thin filaments. This is more of, a, I guess, a, a, a schematic form of the muscle cell. I kind of like both of these diagrams for, for different reasons. Um, so you can see the, uh, so the sarcolemma going from the outside in, transverse tubule dives deep. You can see the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay, storing little calcium ions. 
uh, the little dots inside here are, are the calcium ions. Uh, you can see it's multinucleated, nucleus here, here, and here, lots of mitochondria, which are powerhouses, and you can see the myoglobin and the granules of glycogen there. So this has this is nice a nice schematic diagram showing you all of the major players here. Then you get a chance to see the uh, biofibrils. So here's a myofibril. There's two of them shown in this diagram. And they have the thick and thin filaments that you can't see too well, but you can see here's the thick filament and the thin filament. And, um, you know, you can see that, um, that there is a repeating unit pattern. Okay, that's called a Z-line. That's called a Z-line. But there's a repeating unit pattern there, and we'll understand the significance of that in just a few minutes. Um, there is a protein called dystrophin. That connects to a membrane protein so when these uh, myofibrils shorten they go this way and when they go this way they pull the membranes of the cells this way because dystrophin is connected to the membrane as you can see through this little protein right here when this myofibril shortens it pulls on the muscle cell and if the muscle cell is connected via a tendon to the bone then if a lot of muscle cells contract, it pulls on that tendon, which pulls on that bone. So then we get, uh, you know, muscle contraction. Now, if you don't have dystrophin, there are there is a, a condition called muscular dystrophy, where dystrophin is not made correctly, then you have no control over um, pulling on that muscle membrane. So that means when your muscle contracts, it contracts on the inside, but doesn't pull on the membrane and that causes you to have no, con no control over muscles. Muscles won't contract in the sense that they won't pull on bone. So we have no muscle movement at our movement beyond that point. So that's a serious condition where you lose the dystrophin. So we'll be talking about a few of these proteins through the course of, uh, of this lecture. There are contractile proteins, which are going to aid in contractions, and those are called myosin and actin. This down here is myosin, and this, um, let's see, they don't have actin in this particular, here's actin right here. So um, those are going to be contractile elements. There are regulatory proteins that are going to aid in uh, helping to regulate muscle contractions. Troponin and tropomyosin will be two that we'll talk about. Troponin will join with calcium, and tropomyosin uh, is going to block the ability of myosin to grab a hold of actin um, unless it's rolled off of the of the sites that uh, myosin can grab a hold of and I'll talk about that in a few minutes <coughs> excuse me there are also structural elements um, you know we'll talk about titan and we'll talk about uh, alpha actinin and we just talked about dystrophin but there's uh, other proteins uh, that are going to aid in structurally connecting all of the parts together uh, some of those we won't talk about. Nebulin and myomesin, uh, I don't really talk too much about in this class, but I will talk about Titan, uh, alpha actin, and uh, dystrophin. Okay, so let's talk about these myofibrils. Uh, these myofibrils are going to form the, the characteristic striations associated with, uh, with the skeletal muscle cells. If you look down here in the light micrograph, I hope that you can see the striations there. They look like little stripes. I can see them right there. But these myofibrils are responsible for having that particular repeating unit that you can see. And uh, the repeating unit in muscle cells is called a sarcomere. And, uh, and so I guess the best way to do it is just to show you the vocabulary of that. Uh, a sarcomere is, uh, is a repeating unit that goes from what we call a Z-line to a Z-line. So this Z-line right here is made of proteins that are going to hold on to the thin filaments called actin. So you can see down here we have the actin, the thin filaments are being held on to the Z-line. The thick filaments over here, the, and they're thicker, you can see that they're thicker right there. Um, they're held to what we call the M-line. This is another protein here that holds the thick filaments together. Okay, so, so from Z-line to Z-line we have a sarcomere. And uh, that's the repeating unit that you see inside of, uh, of muscle cells. And uh, because of the overlap of the thick and thin filaments, there are different bands that form. So, for example, if you look at the I-band, 
the I band is this band right here, and it's where you only have thin filaments. The A band, which you have here, let me erase that. So the A band that you have here is going to be where you have only the thick filaments, but maybe you have a little bit of overlap with the thin filaments, but it's a darker band. So if we take a look at the electron micrograph, we can see where there's the darker band, that's the A band, where we have the lighter band, the non-overlap of thick and thin filaments, only the thin filaments, we have the I band. Okay, and it's important that you learn the I bands and A bands and Z lines and M lines because we're going to see during a muscle contraction that certain ones of these bands actually are going to be um, lost uh, during a muscle contraction. So main parts of a sarcomere is what we'll talk about next. So we have I bands, these are the light bands that are going to be the thin actin filaments. They're attached to the Z line through this alpha actinin protein. So that's a structural protein that helps to bind the um, thin filaments to the, I, uh, to the Z lines. And those are the I bands. The A bands are going to be composed of a region where the thick filament myosin and the thin filament actin can overlap. So it's a darker band. The H zone is a light region within the A band, and it's contain, it contains the M line. So if we go back here, this will be the H zone right here. And then the Z line, or Z disc, is the midline interruption in the I band, and it's a protein that connects to the, um, to the thin filaments. Excuse me one second, I need to blow my nose. Sorry about that. So let's see here. We have uh, a muscle cell. So the, I love the artist rendition of this muscle cell that's right here. You can see all of the myofibrils, the thick and thin bundles of thick and thin filaments. You can see the T tubule and the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum wrapping around uh, the myofibrils. And we can see mitochondria over here. So if we pull out a myofiber, which is what the artist has done here, you can see from Z-line to Z-line is a sarcomere. We have, uh, we have very neatly the sarcomere from here to here. You can see the I-band. You can see the A-band. So those are there. You can see the H-zone and the M-line of the proteins they're holding uh, onto the thick filaments. So everything's in place, and, uh, and I like how the artist has done this. Um, the artist has incorrectly drawn this section down here, though. Around each th thick filament should be one, two, three, four, five, six. There should be six thin filaments. They didn't do a very good job of that, but they, you know, um, I guess you can't get everything in a in a drawing that you want. Okay, so um, so down here you can see the H zone. You can see the A band, the I band, the Z lines, Z line. And uh, that makes up from Z line to Z line makes up a sarcomere. So you need to put some time into studying and learning all the parts of the sarcomere so you can understand further things that we talk about um, in regards to the physiology of the muscle cell. Okay, so just a couple more things. The thick filaments are composed of myosin. They run the entire length of the A band. And the thin filaments are composed of a protein called actin, and they run the length of the I band and partway into the A band. And if you go back and look at your diagrams previously, you'll see that, uh, that that's true, a true statement of both of those. The Z disc is, uh, is coin shaped, and it's, uh, it's basically made of a sheet of proteins called alpha actinin, and those are going to anchor the thin filaments, and it also attaches to another protein called titan. Titan is going to be connected to the Z discs and to the M line. And the M line is going to be uh, the line of proteins that's uh, made up of the protein called myomesin, and that is going to hold the thick filaments to the M line. And if we kind of look at everything put together here, so there's that myomesin um, that's connecting to the, uh, to the thick filaments. So here is the 
um, the thick filament right there, myosin. Uh, you can see that it, it extends all the way through the A band. So you can look down here at your A band. And, uh, and you can see there's another protein called Titan. So Titan is this protein right here. And it connects to the Z line, but it also connects all the way to the M line. And it's springy. You can see it almost looks like springs right there. And it'll help to have recoil once the muscle contracts. It helps to bring the muscle cell back um, in regards to the recoil properties back to um, resting state uh, condition. Let me clean this up here just to make sure we don't get too confused about things. So you can see that the thin filament actin is connected to the Z-disc and it goes all the way through the I-band and partially through the A-band. Okay, and it's connected, you know, so you can see that this, it does have some affiliation with the myosin and we'll see how, um, how myosin will pull actin this way and pull actin this way so it pulls the Z-discs or Z-lines closer together causing a contraction to occur. So we'll take a look at that in one second. So if you take and you cut through an I band only, you only get actin filaments. And if you notice, they are arranged, I guess, in a repeating pattern that you can see right here. You see right there, it's almost like a hexagonal pattern that they arrange themselves in. So if I just cut through the I band, this is the arrangement that I get. If I cut only through the H zone, you can see that the myosin is arranged in such a fashion like this, kind of in rows. If I cut through the, um, I don't care if you know that one, but if you cut through the A band at the outer edge where the thick and thin filaments overlap, you can see that around each of the myosins, there are six actins that are arranged around it. Okay, so for every myosin, there are six actin that are arranged around it. Okay, so um, that's going to be pretty important when you call it, when a muscle contraction occurs. So you can cut through cross sectionally through different regions of the um, I bands, the H zone, the A bands, and you can see how these thick and thin filaments are in relation um, to each other. If you look through a um, through an electron micrograph of a muscle cell, you can actually see the thick and thin filaments. So here's a thick filament um, that's going through. Here's a thin filament that's going through. So um, they know pretty much about this uh, this thick and thin filament stuff um, and how it's uh, how it's working. So this is just a longitudinal section showing you the, the how the uh, thick filament is right next to the thin filaments. Uh, you can see that the thick filaments have these little head-like structures called the myosin head. Those myosin heads have on the ends of them, they have binding sites where they can attach to actin. Okay, there's an ATP binding site because you do have to have energy in order to do this activity. Um, there is a flexible hinge region where the thing can go from, you know, from looking like this to looking like this. So it can flex in uh, different uh, ways. So it can grab a hold of things and then flex. Um, so that's a little bit about the thick filament. The thin filament is, is, is super complex too. Um, you can see that the uh, actin right there is made of, of two intertwined um, uh, uh, fibrous proteins. Uh, uh, covering all of the active sites of the actin, the, the sites that myosin would grab a hold of, uh, is, uh, trop uh, is uh, excuse me, tropomyosin, is a cord that covers all of those active sites and blocks them from myosin grabbing a hold of them. Troponin will be a protein that's connected to tropomyosin, and that troponin, when it grabs a hold of calcium, will roll and cause tropomyosin to roll off of those active sites so myosin can grab a hold of it. You know, I'm going to list that out all in notes and give you notes on that. I'm just trying to give you a, a sense of, of why these, why we have a diagram of that and what it's showing. So just talking a little bit more specifically about the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you know, this is a very elaborate network of smooth endoplasmic reticulum that surrounds in, uh, in all dimensions the myofibril. 
there are pairs of these terminal cisternae which are going to exist at the A band I band junctions so where the thick and thin filaments overlap these are where these terminal cisternae uh, are going to sit and they store lots and lots of calcium calcium is going to be really important to a muscle contraction so um, these these sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to regulate uh, intracellular calcium levels and has the ability to dump them out and also to, to pump them back in it has little protein pumps so it can pump up all the calcium that's in the um, the sarcoplasm back into the the um, back into the smooth uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see how they're arranged here. So here you have the the myofibrils, and you can see the terminal cisternae. You can see the transverse tubule. That's the invagination of the sarco of the sarcoloma or cell membrane, and you can see the extensive network of the endoplasmic reticulum going across the uh, the myofibril but where you have that junction of the um, of the a bands uh, excuse me the where you have the the junction of the thin filaments and thick filaments overlapping is where you have the terminal cisternae sitting And then the T-tubules, just being more specific, are the deep protrusions of the sarcolemma, the invaginations of the sarcolemma. And, uh, and again, they occur right there at the I-band, A-band junction. They run between the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and you'll see why that is physically arranged like that in just a second. Together with the paired terminal cisternae, they form the triads. Those triads will encircle each sarcomere and will help the um, thick and thin filaments contract, as you'll see in a minute. So this is just showing you that um, when voltage comes across the membrane, and again I'll give you very specific notes uh, about this, it dives down into the T-tubules. The T-tubules have these very special proteins that are going to be zippered with proteins that control the the exit of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and when a voltage when the voltage comes down it's going to open up these channels these calcium channels and dump calcium over the surface of the myofibril and uh, you know troponin which is connected to tropomyosin which blocks all the sites on actin when troponin grabs a hold of calcium it's going to roll tropomyosin off those active sites and allow myosin to grab a hold of actin. So that's where we're heading towards. So let's let's do a few more things before we can really fully understand why calcium is important and how a muscle is going to contract. So muscle cells only contract when given a command to do this and they're doing done they're given a command through what we call a motor neuron. A motor neuron is a neuron that comes out of the brain and goes to the muscle cells and commands the muscle cells to contract or to relax based on what the brain tells the motor neuron to do. Um, you can see when a motor neuron gets close to a muscle cell, the sarcolemma of a muscle cell, it doesn't physically touch it. So if we look at a blown up view here, here's the sarcolemma. It's got all kinds of invaginations to increase the surface area. And, uh, and you can see that there's a space here called the synaptic cleft, and, uh, and this is the end of the motor neuron right here. The motor neuron, this is called the synaptic knob. Um, it has little vesicles full of neurotransmitters there that when a command is given, those little neurotransmitters will dump the chemicals into the space and tell the muscle cell to go ahead and do a muscle contraction. So this is just showing you that there are millions and millions of receptors on this highly folded membrane of the muscle cell. So this is showing you the invaginations, the increase in surface area of the muscle cell membrane. Uh, and this is showing you the, um, down here, this is showing you the synaptic uh, knob. So the synaptic knob is here. The neurotransmitters are these little circu circular bags of neurotransmitter and uh, they dump into that space but they have to touch a receptor to cause a response in the muscle cell there are millions and millions of these receptors in muscle cells 
And this just more specifically shows you that as a, what we call an action potential as a change in electrical activity that is a, a flood of positive charge comes into the, um, the axon of this, of this um, neuron. The axon is just an extension of the neuron. But as positive charge flows in, there are these, these channels called voltage-gated calcium channels that when you have a positive charge, it changes in its three-dimensional shape and opens a hole that allows calcium to come in. Calcium coming in is the signal for these synaptic vesicles to move down to this membrane. This is called the presynaptic membrane. And these little bags of neurotransmitters are going to dump their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft or the space between the synaptic knob and the muscle cell membrane. These little neurotransmitters will go down and touch a receptor. These are uh, called ligand-gated receptors. And when they touch the receptor, it opens up and allows sodium to flow in, changing the voltage from being a negative charge, like negative 70 millivolts, to being a positive charge. And that positive charge will cause these voltage-gated sodium channels to begin to open up, and it allows positive charge to flow in. Thus, you're changing the charge and you're sending the, sending the signal from the motor neuron to the muscle cell for it to uh, begin a muscle contraction. Okay, and I'll give you step by step some little notes on this in just a, a few minutes. So, you know, you would want to practice this, this and be able to label the, uh, the synaptic knob and the neuromuscular junction. So I'm just going to sketch a little piece of the axon. So this is the axon here. There are voltage-gated sodium channels. So this equals a voltage-gated sodium channel that are all along the length of the axon. You then have the circle equals a voltage-gated calcium channel. And inside we have synaptic vesicles which have neurotransmitter inside of it. The neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine. So this represents a synaptic vesicle. And these are little bags of neurotransmitter. Down here we have the receptors that can receive the information. That's a ligand. R E C E P T E R receptor. These are receptors down here. These are ligated. These are ligate gand gated receptors. And uh, over here, we're going to have voltage gated sodium channels. Okay, so as these voltage-gated sodium channels open up, as the positive wave of positive activity spreads down the axon, the positive charge is going to open up that voltage-gated calcium channel to allow calcium to come into the cell. Calcium is going to be the signal to cause these synaptic vesicles to fuse with and dump their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. So this is the synaptic cleft right here. And this is the this is going to be the presynaptic membrane. This is the postsynaptic membrane. These little neurotransmitters come down and they're going to cause the ligand gated channels to open up and allow sodium to flow in. When enough sodium flows in, it causes the voltage gated sodium channels to each fire, causing the wave of positive charge to flow across the membrane of the muscle cell. It's almost like a pebble in the pond. Here's the little pebbles, and then the voltage change is going to, or the ripple wave is going to spread across the surface of the cell of the of the muscle cell membrane. Okay, that's going to spread, it's going to spread, 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 and it's going to dive deep because you get to the transverse tubules. That wave of positive charge can dive deep into the interior of the muscle cell. This is called the synaptic knob here. It's an important part to know, um, but I'll give you some more specific instructions in just a second on that. 
So the, uh, the neuromuscular junction is a place where a motor neuron and a muscle fiber intersect. Muscle cells only contract when given a command by a motor neuron. The signal to contract comes from a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitters are held in those little sacs called synaptic vesicles that we saw before. They're at the end of the motor neuron. When the brain commands movement, the synaptic vesicles fuse with the cell membrane. They dump the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters are going to alter the muscle cell and the contraction will occur. Okay, so step by step. We have the action potential arrives at the axon terminal of the motor neuron, so it arrives at the synaptic knob. Voltage-gated calcium channels are going to open because of the change in voltage, and calcium is going to enter into the synaptic vesicle. The calcium is going to enter, causing the synaptic vesicles to fuse and to release their contents by exocytosis into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. It'll diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptors in the sarcolemma. That's the muscle cell membrane. Acetylcholine, this is the abbreviation for acetylcholine, will bind and open the, um, the ion channels and they'll allow sodium to flow in. A little bit of potassium leaks out when that channel opens up, but more sodium flows in than, 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 than potassium leaking out. This causes a depolarization, so we're going from being negative in the interior to being positive, and that is called depolarization. Now this wave of, uh, of positive charge flowing in is called the action potential, and it's propagated like a pebble in a pond. It's propagated across the sarcolemma um, by the opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels. Now that acetylcholine um, you know, as long as it's bound to those receptors, we'll keep flowing sodium in. Well, if you want to stop a muscle cell contraction, if you want to terminate that, you have to have a breakdown of the, uh, of the acetylcholine or that neurotransmitter. And this is accomplished by acetylcholinesterase. This is an enzyme that will come by and it will gobble up the acetylcholine on those receptors. So once that happens, the uh, voltage-gated uh, uh, potassium channels are going to uh, uh, are going to close until the interior of the sarcolemma goes back to negative charge, and so this is going to cause a repolarization to occur. This actually should say voltage-gated potassium channels are going to uh, remain uh, open. My apologies on that. That should say open, not closed. And uh, so there are little voltage-gated potassium channels that are opened up. They're going to open up in, uh, until the interior of the sarcolemma goes back to negative, and this causes a repolarization to occur. Um, so the sodium-potassium pump is going to work to aid in uh, helping to reestablish the ionic balance. Um, and the sodium and potassium leak channels that we learned about much, much earlier on in this class, they're going to restore ionic balance to resting state potential. So let me show you what that looks like. So when we have, uh, when we have a change in charge, an action potential that's going uh, across the membrane, we allow the depolarization to occur because sodium channels are actually open. So if we have these voltage-gated sodium channels, they're going to open. They're going to take the membrane from being negative to being positive, just the interior of that membrane um, from being negative 70 to about positive 30-ish millivolts. So that depolarization occurs as long as the sodium channels are open, allowing positive charge to flow in. Eventually, though, those sodium channels are going to snap shut because you can't have a muscle contraction forever. When they snap shut, you get an opening of the potassium channels. These potassium channels will open up and they will cause positive charge to flow out of the cell. Thus, when they dump negative charge, excuse me, positive charge outside the cell, you can see that the membrane potential is becoming more negative. And that's what we call repolarization occurring. Once those potassium channels close, we'll then get the activity of sodium leak channels, potassium leak channels, and sodium potassium pump. We'll get all of those, those uh, members working so that we go back to resting state um, potential, which is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, 
So go back and look at your notes there and, uh, and get a sense of what's occurring there. Uh, make sure you change that close to open because we got to dump the positive charge out of the cell to get it back to, um, to negative 70 millivolts. All right. So um, at this time, I think I'll stop and we'll take a small break. We'll do steps to muscle contraction when we do the second part of this video. So until then, I will see you then.